All right, thank you guys for coming out to the Open Source Summit security track. My name is Sabri Blackman. I'm a senior security engineer at Docker, uh, filling in for Justin, who is doing Justin stuff. Ah, there's Justin. <laughs> You can carry on, anyway. Okay. I'll take it out as well. All right. Very good. Continue doing Justin things. Um, this, <laughs> this is Tim from Stira. You're a CTO and co-founder. He's going to be doing the first talk. Um, and this is going to be pretty interactive, I think. Um, we're going to be re uh, repeating questions for this is being recorded. Um, so try to be clear and loud if you have any questions. Um, and have fun. All right, how's everybody doing? Enjoying DockerCon? All right, very good, very good. So uh, my name is Tim Henricks. I am the CTO and co-founder at Styra. I'm also one of the co-founders of the Open Policy Agent. Today, I'm going to be talking about Kubernetes security. But before we get started, I wanted to just get a sense as to how familiar you all are with Kubernetes. So quick show of hands, who is using Kubernetes today? All right, leave your hand up if. You're using Kubernetes in production. All right, so that's pretty good. That's about a third, maybe? OK, so maybe two thirds are using it, and a third are in production. Um, also, so like, what kinds of folks are here? Like, what kind of roles do you have? Who here uh, uh, is thinking of themselves as like a platform engineer, somebody responsible for running Kube or Docker uh, for the rest of the folks in the org? OK, how about application developers? All right, about equal numbers there. How about maybe security? OK, about the same. Uh, compliance? Team leads, management? All right, we've got a good mix of folks. This should be fun. Um, so I mentioned I'm going to be talking about Kubernetes security. In particular, you'll see I'm going to talk about desired state security for Kubernetes. So what I want to do is start by just sort of defining that, because that's not a, a well-defined term yet. So here's how I think about Kubernetes and how it works. On the left-hand side, I, as an application developer, describe what I want Kubernetes to do. I describe my desired state, my intent for what applications, what components of those applications I want Kubernetes to run for me. We do that in YAML. On the left-hand side there, you see a pod or a deployment descriptor in YAML. That is my desired state. It's what I want Kubernetes to do. Runtime state is the bits that are flowing, the, the processes that are running on servers, the bits that are flowing from process to process, from node to node, the runtime state is what Kubernetes creates based on my desired state. Right? In my head, I think of Kubernetes as fundamentally taking my desired state and turning it into runtime state. And this is really powerful, right? Because then I, as a developer, can simply say, I want two copies of Nginx running. Kubernetes, if they're none running, will go ahead and create those two copies, put them on different servers in this, in this example. More powerfully, though, if one of those servers dies, now Kubernetes knows I only have one copy of Nginx running. It knows that doesn't match the desired state, and so it will spin up another copy of Nginx. All right, so desired state, runtime state. This is incredibly powerful, and this is what Kubernetes does to a greater extent than any other system I've seen. There are, of course, challenges when it comes to security. There are dangers, the old dangers of the past that we've always had to deal with across compute, networking, and storage. They still exist in this Kubernetes world. They still exist, and they all apply to that desired state. Right? If you think about compute, Kubernetes makes it incredibly easy to run arbitrary binaries off the internet. That's great, right? Obviously, it's also dangerous. Right? And that danger you can see by just looking at the desired state. Networking, a good example here is Kubernetes makes it very easy to connect applications to external domain names, right? Stira.com, Huli.com, whatever you want it to be. But at the same time, Kubernetes also makes it incredibly easy to misconfigure that networking so that you end up with two applications where one application steals traffic from another because they're both configured and pointed at the same domain name. Again, you can see that in the desired state. You can protect yourself from that danger by looking at desired state. Storage, mission-critical data can be automatically deleted when workloads move to new nodes. That's incredibly powerful. That's a great, there's a great deal of automation there. Again, you can protect yourself from that danger by looking at and controlling that desired state. 
security, which pods are running in privileged mode, are you encrypting data at rest and in transit? These are all dangers that we can see and, and protect ourselves from by looking at the desired state. The Open Policy Agent is an open source project designed to be a general purpose policy engine. One, and one of its most popular use cases, is protecting the desired state of Kubernetes. This is something that, as, as one of the, the folks behind OPA, we've seen just uh, take off in the last six months. People that, from companies that we've never even heard of come up to us at, at shows like this one and say, you know what, I'm already running OPA to protect my desired state in Kubernetes. The reason that this is so popular is because putting good safeguards and guardrails around the desired state in Kubernetes is actually technically somewhat challenging if you're trying to use something like RBOC or ABOC. Right? OPA was, was purpose-built for doing analysis over arbitrary YAML files, to, to write policy, to write ACLs, to write authorization over those YAML files. Right? That's exactly what you have to do when you're trying to protect yourself from all those dangers we talked about on the last slide. You have to be able to take an arbitrary piece of YAML and make a decision, is this YAML, is this deployment safe or is it not? Is it pulling an image from an untrusted registry? Is this ingress misconfigured to, to use the same domain name as another ingress that's already deployed inside of Kubernetes? So when I think about OPA, I think about it is, it, its, its purpose in life, at least for this use case, is to ensure that you can put the guardrails and safeguards you want around that desired state. And in so doing, you're protecting the runtime state as well. All right, now how does this work? Um, the way that we run OPA today is we run it basically as part of the Kubernetes API server. So on each and every uh, request that a developer makes um, of Kubernetes, let's say they're trying to create that deployment we looked at a little while ago, that deployment goes into the Kubernetes API server. There's an entire pipeline of, of security controls that Kubernetes supports, authentication, authorization, that's where you'd see RBOC, and then finally admission control. We set up OPA as a validating admission controller, which means that on every create, update, and delete, you end up giving OPA that entire chunk of YAML, uh, and then OPA will make a decision as to whether or not this YAML is safe to go into Kubernetes proper. It, OPA makes a decision as to whether this chunk of YAML is safe to, for Kubernetes to treat it as proper desired state. Um, and once that, uh, if, the, if the resource makes it all the way through authentication, authorization, and admission, then it becomes desired state, and Kubernetes does what it does best, which is to automate the, 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 the realization, the rendering of that runtime state based on that desired state. Let's zoom in one level more, because what I'm going to do after this is we're going to do some live coding. We're going to sit here together and write some policies maybe some of which you will, you will suggest to me on the spot, um, and, and then we will see this in action. So the way that this works, one, and, and one more level of detail, is that the, the, every kubectl create or kubectl apply or, uh, uh, ends up as a request to the Kubernetes API server. The API server, in turn, will hand to OPA that collection of YAML. It's actually been tweaked a little bit, and you'll see this a little later, but that, uh, that original chunk of YAML that I as a developer wrote, Kubernetes performs a, a number of mutations to it and hands the result off to OPA. OPA then has two things, or actually two more things, that it will use to make decisions about whether or not this YAML, this proposed addition to desired state, is safe or not. The one is shown here in orange. It is the policy. And we'll be writing some of these policies, obviously. It's written in a, in a language called Rego. The second thing, though, that you can provide to OPA is additional data, additional context. This data could be anything you want, quite literally. It could be, uh, for example, uh, maybe a list of users who um, are currently on call. You know, typically that data would come out of something like PagerDuty, right? Kubernetes doesn't know who's on call. Uh, Active Directory doesn't know who's on call, but PagerDuty does know who's on call. So what you could do is actually go ahead and take that PagerDuty data and shove it into OPA, make it available for writing policy um, on each and every one of these API requests. Then once OPA makes a decision, it will return that decision to the Kubernetes API server. And there on the right-hand side, you see an example of the kind of uh, a decision uh, that it returns. In this case, it's an arbitrary JSON object, 
It's, 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 um, there's an allow key, and in this case, the decision was to not allow the resource, so it's false. And moreover, there's a reason. That reason describes to the end user the error message that they need in order to know why the decision was rejected. Um, and so if I run kubectl create on this Nginx pod and, and OPA denies it, then in fact it will tell me why that was denied. Obviously, if I don't have that um, as a developer, that's going to be difficult. All right, and so now we're going to become a bit more interactive. I had to give you some background before we made this, uh, uh, before I could hear from you all. So what I want to pose now to everybody here in the room is what kind of guardrails have you seen? Is, is this something that you've run into? And if so, how have, you, um, how have you tried to protect and safeguard your desired state? Do we have any volunteers? Have, have, well, actually, maybe a show of hands. Who has run into a problem like this uh, on Kubernetes today? OK, good. Couple. All right. Are you guys also running in production? Yes, yes. Not yet. All right, well, do you guys have examples you want to share? No? <laughs> well, I can give you two. Uh, I'll give you two. Uh, well, I've actually already talked through a couple of them. So one is uh, images, right? Here, here uh, obviously, Kubernetes makes it easy to run arbitrary binaries from anywhere on the internet. Uh, what we see a lot of folks do uh, using OPA with, to, to do this desired state kind of security is um, to, to control which registries those image, images come out of. Is that something you guys have seen? Three of you. I lost the third one. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, how about the ingress problem, where you configure a couple of ingresses um, and when you do that, you configure them both to pull from the same domain. Not yet. This will cause outages. We have seen this uh, several times where people will actually take OPA and put it in place just to avoid the outages that are caused when you misconfigure a couple of ingresses. Okay. Well, what I thought I'd do at this point is switch over and do some live coding. So y'all didn't give me... Um, uh, new policies that I could try to write on the spot. So in that sense, you've made this a lot easier on me. Uh, but what we'll do is go ahead and, and work through a couple, of these, uh, a couple of these policies and just show you sort of end to end what you could do um, uh, um, to get started with this uh, when you walk out of here. All right. OK, so the first one that we'll do is image repository safety. Um, what we're going to start with is, so we're in this setting where uh, somebody's going to, some developer is going to actually go ahead and say, I want to create that same Nginx, uh, I guess it's a pod in this case, an Nginx pod. And here, um, this is probably okay, Nginx and, uh, and MySQL are going to be part of the pod. They're going to be the images that we're going to run inside that pod. Um, but as a, as a cluster administrator, what I've decided, what our organization has decided is that I want to ensure that only... Uh, images from my trusted corporate repository are the ones that we use. Okay, and so the question then becomes, well, how do we do this in OPA? You've seen sort of architecturally where OPA sits. It's part of the API server. The piece that was missing from all that slideware was really what are the policies that you write? What are the policies that you hand to OPA? So we're going to write them live here. Um, so let's say that we want to encode the policy that says all images have to come from my trusted repository. How do I do that? So the first thing that we do in writing policy with OPA is every policy has a package name, and that package name is sort of just like a package name in Python. It's just, it just a module of, of policy uh, statements that you're going to make. So let's go ahead and just uh, give it a name. Um, actually, in fact, we're going to call it Kubernetes.admission. All the policies that, the way we've set up OPA is that all the policies need to have that package in order to be enforced by the, by the admission controller. All right, um, and so what we're going to do here is we're going to write a simple deny statement, right? Just like you might expect. This is going to be a blacklist kind of uh, uh, policy. And what we're going to do is instead of it being just a straight up deny allow, very Boolean in, in nature, we're going to have a deny that actually returns an error message. And so that's kind of what the syntax is. And technically what that deny is is we're defining deny as a set. It's a set of error messages that get returned to the API server. All right, and so what we started with here is that um, we have a deny statement, and we want to deny um, any request that comes in um, where the kind 
is let's just say we're going to deny pods. All right, we're only going to write this for pods. Um, and so what, one of the things that's happening here is that this input is, is a reserved word in, in OPA. It's one of the very few reserved words in OPA. And what it represents is that chunk of YAML that you see on the left-hand side. So that YAML is what the admission controller is sending to OPA in order for OPA to make a decision. All right, so input represents that entire thing. So input.request.kind.kind. .kind .kind. We're going to check that it's equal to pod. All right. Second thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, and now what, we, what we're going to do is look at all of the containers that exist inside of that YAML. And this is one of the reasons, technically, why using something like OPA is, is a good call for this kind of admission control use case. Because in this case, we're going to have to iterate. We're going to have to iterate over all of the containers that show up in this pod. And so again, the way we do that is we dot down into the appropriate place, input.request.object.spec.containers. And now what we're going to want to do is actually iterate over all of the containers within that, um, within that pod. And so we can iterate uh, uh, using here just the underscore. I can say more later. Um, and then we're going to grab the image. All right, and then we're going to give that a name. All right. So what this is going to do is it's going to find all of the images inside the pod. And then it's going to apply the following logic. We're going to say, well, let's check. If that image doesn't start with, and here um, I'm going to say that our trusted repository is Huli.com. Who here thinks that's a good, safe, trusted re registry? Torin, yeah, OK. I'll let you all figure out why that's not a great choice. Um, all right, and then finally, all right, so now if all these things hold, if it's a pod, and if we've got a, grabbed a container image, and that container image does not start with huli.com, then we're going to go ahead and deny uh, this request, and we're going to return an error message. So let's say the error message is here, pod contains image from untrusted registry. And we'll go ahead and provide the image name, because there could be more than one. In this case, remember, we've got Nginx, and, and we've got um, and MySQL. All right. All right, so now one thing I could do at this point is I've got my policy. Um, I'm using VS Code, and we've got a, a plug in here for VS Code that every time you save it, it's going to do a syntax check. So the fact that I could save it and you didn't see error messages means I didn't, I didn't make any typos here. Now, one thing I could do is I could load this up into OPA, running on Kubernetes, and start throwing pods at it to see if it's actually doing the right thing. What we recommend instead, though, is writing some unit tests. And so those unit tests are going to let me uh, very quickly test whether this, is, this policy is correct before I put it into, into OPA proper. All right? And so for that, what I need is, is a sample input um, that, uh, that represents this same, this same input. And so I, we don't, uh, inside of um, the policy language Rego here, it's really a superset of JSON. And so what, I'm, what I've grabbed here is just a JSON representation of that YAML file. Um, and then we'll just go ahead and, and inject it there. So now we've got an input that represents exactly that same set of containers that we saw a moment ago, that same pod. And now what we'll do is go ahead and, and write a test. All right, so what we want to do is we want to write a test and say, uh, go ahead and check deny with input as in. And so what we're doing here is we're sort of mocking out the input, right? Input is like a reserved word in, in OPA. And, and typically, when you're running this as part of uh, the Kubernetes admission controller, that input gets bound to whatever the admission controller provides. In this case, obviously, we don't, want, we're, we don't have the admission controller in the works. And so we're going to mock out that input value to, to be the thing that we care about. All right. And now a deny is a set, and so I'm actually just going to assign uh, the, the result of evaluating deny with that input uh, to a variable. All right, so one of the cool things that you can do here is, as you saw, there was an error in the better hygiene here is to go ahead and put the in definition inside of the rule, so I'll go ahead and do that. All right, so let's go ahead and do this again. One of the cool things that you can do here inside of this VS Code plugin is go ahead and, and do an evaluation. Hmm. 
inside the editor. Okay, so I made a silly mistake that the, that the parser didn't catch. All I did here in the sprintf is that you have to hand a, an array of arguments. It's not quite the same as Go, sorry. All right, so let's go ahead and evaluate now what this, um, what this part of the policy gave us. And in this case, it shows us what the actual value returns. Um, and so, <laughs> in fact, I had some extra files hanging around. All right, and so when we, do, when we go ahead and do this evaluation, what we're going to see is the actual error messages come up. And so in this case, we see two of them, that the pod contains image from untrusted registry Nginx, and the pod contains the image from the untrusted registry MySQL. So that's what we'd expect, right? Um, one of the things that uh, I would actually do, obviously, here is that as we're writing a unit test is say that the count of actual equals two or something similar. Obviously, checking the error message is something that would be better. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we've written a test and if we go ahead and evaluate that, we get the answer is true. One of the cool things, though, that you can do is run the, the proper unit test uh, here right inside of the, the editor. And here you get you know, what you'd expect, sort of a, a one out of one passing. All right. Anybody have questions here, comments? Yes? Very good. Yeah, so I, I, I cheated here a little bit. I, I used a starts with instead of the proper kind of parsing of the, of the image name inside of the, the, um, the, the, the do it. So what I should have done is a proper image parsing, parsing of that image name inside the YAML file, and then compared the host to, to Huli.com as a whole. Yeah. So if you have that kind of parsing, you might go with Yep, 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 you can do that. Very hard to write that parser, though, uh, live in front of everyone. OK. Anything else? Questions? Thoughts? I've come up with a use case as well. You've come up with one? <laughs> I had to kind of like think, think about it for a little while to figure out what I wanted to, to ask you about. OK. I'll, I'll come back. Yeah, I have a feeling you're going to get to this, but uh, are you going to maybe describe what's a good case for kind of a static cloud security policy or a different things such as this? Right, right. So the uh, question was, uh, how about uh, pod security policies, how do they compare to this? Uh, yeah, obviously, what I, I'm sort of cherry picking a, a very common example here. One of the things that we've seen is that um, uh, you know, talking to like, some of the OpenShift folks this is a good example. Like, we talked to them back in Berlin. One of the things they said was inside of OpenShift, there are 40 or 50 of these sort of Go-written admission controllers. And what they had heard is that there were just so many, like there was just this long tail of customer asks for different admission controllers inside of Kube that they could just never develop. And so what they saw as powerful here is that not only can you do this sort of standard out of the, uh, this, this sort of standard and very, very common policies, but you could also, as, as from the customer's perspective, write whatever custom policies they, they needed. Um, and so, yeah, it's a good question. There was one more. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the question is, how would we integrate this with a third-party source of information, like PagerDuty was the example I gave? Yeah, so uh, OPA does include a, a couple ways that you could get external data in, uh, one of which is that you, it has a, a, an HTTP API, and so you can simply push data uh, as JSON, as you might expect, into the API. Uh, another option is, th that is up to you, however, how you do that, right? Everybody has different sources of data. Um, another option that you can use to get um, information into OPA is what we call uh, like the bundle API. So what that does is it will assume that there's some centralized server somewhere that has all the policies that OPA needs in order to make decisions. And it will periodically pull those policies down. And when it pulls that policy down, that policy can include that external data. 
Anybody else? Yeah. Can you maybe talk a little bit about Rego and the language syntax? How did you come to that? Oh, how did we come? Yeah, so the question is, can I say something more about Rego, the syntax, and how we arrived at that? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good story. So uh, when we started, um, when we started out with, with, with OPA, really, even before OPA, uh, we, we knew that we, were, that we needed to write these kinds of policies over uh, you know, sort of cloud-native resources. Um, and so what we saw in the cloud-native world was there's a tremendous amount of JSON everywhere. If you run any one of the public cloud's APIs, obviously you're going to just get a, a giant amount of data that's come out of it. Uh, a giant amount of JSON data that come out of it. Um, and so in the early days, we said, we're not going to invent a new language. I, I've done that a dozen times. I don't want to do it again. Um, and so what we did was we tried a bunch of existing languages uh, with these like cloud-native JSON payloads to try to write policy over them. Um, we tried SQL. We tried data log. We tried all the kind of usual suspects there. One of the things we found was that um, you know, in the early days, we tried a, a just like straight up SQL or something like that. And so the, the problem with SQL here is that traditionally SQL doesn't have hierarchical nesting, like you see cl quite clearly there uh, in the YAML. And so in order to use straight up SQL, you need to take that YAML and flatten it down into relational tables. We tried this on, I think it was one of Azure's APIs, and from one API call that just said, give me all the instances, all the servers, all the, all the, all the instances, um, the result was 200 relational tables. <laughs> None of them were documented. They were all synthetic. It was a mess. Like, there was just, like, I, I've written a lot of policy, and I can tell you I couldn't write policy over that 200 tables. What was worse, though, was that when you had those 200 tables, you ended up writing bricks of SQL that would effectively reconstruct that hierarchical structure that you needed via joins. So you would have like 10, 15 joins that you'd write in order to reconstruct that hierarchical data, and then you'd write one or two conditions to actually check the properties that you wanted. We even tried a variant of SQL uh, that came out of like the document DB. I think Microsoft had it at the time. I think Google's got something like it now that includes uh, JSON support more natively. Um, and for that, uh, we ended up realizing that um, we tried that for six months, I think. Uh, and then that was just, we just all sort of hated it, uh, to be honest. It was just not natural in any way, shape, or form. The key sort of insight into this Rego language is really uh, what you see here, all right, which is, we all know how to dot down through YAML and JSON, right? That's all we're doing here, right? Conceptually, all, all we did here is we're dotting through it, and then we're writing constraints on the objects that come out. That was the core, that was the impetus, that was the core, the origination of, of Rego, is just that's how you should have to, that's how you should be able to write policy. Grab stuff out of those, those hierarchically nested JSON documents, and then write constraints over them. And that's all Rego is, and then everything else has sort of grown up around that. Uh, so it's a good question. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm not saying they didn't exist. Like I said, this document DB lets you kind of do that, uh, but but not in a not in a declarative way. It was it was sure. Yeah, you know Python, you can dig in there. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Somebody, you, you had a you had a, a, an example. What was your example? So um, we often get requests uh, to be able to control uh, who is allowed to, uh, to run code as a particular service account inside the namespace, right? So, so you like, create service accounts with Kubernetes. These have, have our back privileges that say what those service accounts can do. Mm -hmm. So you're saying you're somehow giving people in the real world the ability to run as service accounts. Yeah. Okay. And so then, okay. So then, what? Uh, so then, you want to write policy that describes who can take on which service account? Yeah. Okay. Um, so then the question is, oh, so you want to write that policy? Is that what yeah, we're saying? Yeah, I, want, I, want to, I want to be able to enforce a policy that, that's like that. And, and here's the tricky thing. Yeah. Uh, creating pods is not just creating pods, right? Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. uh, that is also allowed to create pods, and I want to be able mm -hmm. to control what, what these guys are, are able to do. 
Okay. Um, and so you're saying, uh, sorry, I got to repeat that. So um, in addition to having individual users uh, basically be able to uh, act as service accounts, you want to be able to, ha uh, you, the added wrinkle here is that you've got um, uh, daemon sets, replica sets, uh, and the like that are all creating pods. And so what, what, what do you do there, right? Um, so that's a good question. One of the things that, um, it, um, one of the things that comes up here is, and this comes to this speaks to some of the customizability or the the uniqueness that that every uh, deployment uh, deals with, and that is that um, it's it's unclear to me on the face of it whether if somebody says I want all pods to come from whatever Huli, uh, whether that applies to daemon sets as well or not. Right, and so uh, here we happen to condition this on pods. If we wanted to condition this on daemon sets. Let's go ahead and do that. Whoops. Daemons. Did I spell that right? No. Daemon set. So you could apply it to pods and daemon sets and replica sets and all of them if you like, right? And so, you know, I think the, the, there are all these cases in Kube where if, if you, um, you can get into sort of a bad state, whereas if you put this on just a pod and somebody created a daemon set that had these images not from Huli.com, that daemon set would be allowed, right? Or that replica set would be allowed. But the pod then would not be able to be created, right? And so that's something you may want to avoid. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't think there's. I don't think there's a perfect answer. Is I guess what I'm getting at here. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Question was: Do you have to write separate policies for each of those? And the answer is no. Um, so resources. Daemon So I'm just going to create a, a little set here that has the types that I want. What I would want to do, though, is obviously parameterize this from outside. Um, but, but this would be the way you could do this for now. Replica set. All right. And then let's say resources. So now we'll just ask, is, is that input.request.kind in that resources set? So sure. Yeah. Good question. Hey, how long do we have? Justin, how long? Um, any, any, anybody else? These are good questions. Keep them coming. Okay. Well, good. So I've got one other policy. Uh, oh, yeah. Just one real quick. Uh, so if you ever use like just deny policies, like you can do variables to like a, I don't know, just get more reuse out of it. Like what's the point of having that? Like if you're never going to use it, like this individually, Yeah. Again, this is just like what can I write on the fly? Yeah. So. Oh no 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 that's good. One of, one of the one of the so just like we had a set of uh, resources, you could create sets of those of those um, registry names. You could also uh, you could also there are so it looks like here this is just a flat deny statement, but you could do uh, but there is reuse built into the language as well. So if you wanted to call this um, repo safety, you could do something like this. Let's say let's say we did this the silly way. And we started with, and we hard coded this to, um, well, we wouldn't want to do that. Let's do that. Let's just say we wanted to do it this way. And then you wanted to, eh, go away. And then we wanted to deny of message if input.request.kind.kind equals pod and repo safety of message. Right, so we've sort of defined a helper t uh, a table there that allows you to um, reuse that logic however you like. Again, you don't have to. This is a bad example, but it's what I came up with on the spot. Yeah? Cool. All right, I've got one other policy that I wanted to show you. This, this policy was pretty simple in the sense that all you needed in order to make the decision was the incoming YAML, that, that uh, deployment definition. There are some policies, though, where you, in fact, want to be able to use and need the other information about the state of the Kubernetes cluster. Ingress conflicts is one of those. So the ingress conflict policy is one where we want to ensure, where the, the problem is that if you have two ingresses and they're both configured to use the same host, the same domain, then one can steal traffic from another. And that's just, that just boils down to how the, how the, uh, the ingress controller works. Obviously, in order to stop that kind of misconfiguration, any one ingress is fine, right? I can create any one ingress, and there's no way to, to have that problem. 
But if I create a second ingress, then what I need to do is look at the domain or that host, compare it to the host and all the other existing ingresses in order to make a decision. All right? So that's what this second policy illustrates. Uh, let me go and uh, so let's just create another one package. Again, it's going to be a deny statement. This time we're going to do, we're going to check if it is an ingress. Um, the other thing we're going to do is then we're going to go ahead. Oh, here, I should bring the, the data up for you. All right, so here's the ingress uh, schema. So if we go ahead now and we do input.request.object, here what we're looking for is the host. All right? That host is what we're looking for. So we're going to extract it input.request.object.spec.rules, and that looks like it's an array. And then we're going to go to, um, and then we're going to grab the host. Okay, so this is the, the new host. All right. All right, and now what we're going to have to do is go off and look at all the existing ingresses. All right, how do we do that? Well, one of the cool things that, um, that, that you can do, obviously, another application of that external data that you can shove into OPA is that when you run these things, the, you, you can set it up so that um, all of the current state of Kubernetes or whatever portion of that state you care about is replicated into OPA so that it's there and available for you to write policy. So in that case, uh, the way that that would happen is it would be inserted the way that we, we set it up is it, it gets inserted into data.kubernetes.ingresses. Um, and then there's a namespace and a name. And then from there, you go ahead and you've got a very similar structure to the one you see above. So it's actually going to be spec rules uh, dot host. So that's an old host. All right, so now we've got the new host and we've got the old host. And you could do, obviously, more, more interesting and more accurate comparisons. Today, we'll just do new host equals old host. All right, so the question that we're asking here is, is the incoming ingress, is it, is it configuring a host that is the same host as one that's already been configured somewhere in the, in the Kubernetes uh, list of ingresses? Right, that list of ingresses, this data.kubernetes.ingresses, would be the same list that you would get if you did a kubectl get in, in, ingresses. All right. Um, and then finally, we're going to say the message is again, what are we going to call this? We're going to say ingress v conflicts with ingress. Uh, yeah, whichever. Ingress conflicts. OK. Any questions here? Uh, yeah. Line four. Sorry, the question was, is line four a test or an assignment? Ah, very good. Turns out there is a, there is a single equals which does whichever one it needs to. to um, so use double equals, use colon equals. Then it's very clear whether it's an assignment or it's a comparison. Anything else? Time. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. So this could potentially have to do a lot of iteration. It could. And I wondered if at some point you could talk about that kind of scale. Uh huh. Because we run some projects and these kinds of things are kind of a lot of comparison. Yeah. Question was uh, that could entail uh, some amount of iteration, and so what, what do you do in terms of scale? We, we, we've had uh, n numerous folks running um, uh, open production for in using these kinds of, of policies, and nobody is, has said has complained about uh, performance. Obviously, you could write policies <laughs> with this kind of iteration that do take a long time, and we do have you know guides for how to structure your policies and how to avoid that that kind of 
of performance problem. One of the nice things, though, here is that this is a use case. It's Kubernetes use case. If you spent 10 milliseconds, even 100 milliseconds, it's not the end of the world. There are other use cases OPA is also used for, like microservice uh, API authorization, and their performance is much more important. You've got to be able to hit like one millisecond or better. Um, and so obviously we've done some performance tuning for that that carries over uh, into this use case as well. But I'm getting the, 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 the so I think we're about out of time. Um, any last questions or comments? OK, we got two. You've both asked questions, so I'll, I'll go with the more recent, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, that's in the works. Um, well, why don't we chat offline and we can go into more of the, the details, but yeah, that's something we've had to do before. Oh, new one, yeah. Um, how do you see OPA in terms of like, the emission control chain? Uh, because if you are somewhere a bit later, the thing is there's drift between uh, the original image, the original declaration, yeah. once again. Um, yeah, where do you see this happening? And also, how do you see it working as a type of policy thing? Like, yeah. The question was, how does OPA work uh, with the whole ecosystem of admission controllers effectively? A um, couple of things there. Um, it, it, it will play nicely with all the others because it just hooks into the normal admission controller. So yes, as an administrator, you would have to know if you've hooked up OPA and six other things, like what's going to happen. They, it is a pipeline, though, when you set it up for validation. So if any one of them rejects, then it gets rejected. And so in that sense, the semantics is pretty clear. Um, you asked. Oh, and then you were also sort of asking about, well, what happens if um, there's some sort of like uh, lag or delay uh, so that the, the, when OPA makes a decision, it's a little late or something's out of date or something. Um, and, and so for that, again, like, yes, they're, they're, like if you're replicating data into Kubernetes for this ingress example, or sorry, into, into OPA for, like, for this ingress example, uh, then yeah, there's a chance that there's a, some racy kind of condition there. Again, um, folks that have been running it see there's enough value and you catch enough of these cases that it, it's worth doing. Uh, and then what you can do is audit after the fact. Yeah. All right, so I think I, I need to wrap up. Um, so thanks all for listening. Remember, my name's Tim Henricks. Uh, what you saw here today was totally open source. You can do this um, uh, with straight up OPA. This approach, though, that you see where you're using OPA to, to write um, policies uh, and, and enforce them at emission control time, uh, there is a, a relatively new project that we're going to announce more formally at, at, um, in the near future called OPA Gatekeeper. It sort of gives you a Kubernetes native flavor for doing this. Um, if you're running on the public cloud, you can go ahead and see this kind of thing. Uh, I think Azure's already released something. Uh, it's in the works for Google. Um, and then if you've got like uh, multi-cloud, on-prem kinds of things, uh, uh, Stira can help you out there. So um, thank you all. Oh, one quick question. What was the first part of your question? Yeah. So are you able to apply all these policies on demand? Uh, the question was, uh, there can be races. Can we apply these policies on demand? Oh, yeah, yeah. You can certainly take these policies and, and uh, apply them before, uh, before like offline, like in a, in a GitOps kind of setting or even on your developer laptop. So the, the policies are portable. Is, is that what you're getting at? Like you can apply them at admission control time or as part of your GitOps pipeline or, or as part of your... Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's sort of... So he was just asking, so suppose that the admission controller misses some ingress that goes into the cluster uh, and it does, in fact, conflict in this very rare case that that's possible. Uh, can you run the policies after the fact and find all of those cases? And the answer is yes. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all. So I'm here today to talk to you about a container escape bounty that I'm working with the Linux Foundation um, trying to kick off. So this is, should be short and sweet. So why do we want to do this? Containers are becoming adopted pretty much everywhere these days, and they're becoming a critical part of everyone's infrastructure. And for a lot of these cases, security is quite paramount for these. If you've been to my earlier talks, you found out that we use containers extensively at Netflix. And what we're wanting to do is get some more eyeballs on 
um, the security features that we rely on for containers. And also, we're wanting to um, address a common tragedy in open source software, in that, in theory, anybody can look at open source software. Somebody should look at the open source software, but often nobody does. And so you end up with these cases where these fundamental things that people rely on for their security, like OpenSSL, um, don't get the kind of attention that they deserve. Um, Linux kernel is a bit better than that. A lot more people look at it. But we're trying to encourage people to focus in on user namespaces, C groups, set comp, the major LSMs, basically the things that the kernel uses to create containers. Um, inspired by Jess Frazell's contain.af, we thought one way to lower the barrier to entry is to create a web portal where people can log in, choose what container they want to run, like Ubuntu latest, choose the security policy out of a, a set of options to apply, and then get a shell in the container and go to town. They can um, build their own tools in there, they can um, try to do a container escapes, try to see can they influence another container. And so basically every researcher will get their own VM in which they can launch their containers. And so as part of this, we're wanting to build a partnership of interested companies, people who rely on the security of containers for their business operations. Um, and so as part of this, we're thinking, well, what's a, co a few common ground rules that make sense? So we're thinking, well, if you're going to join us to help improve security, we don't want you to be um, stockpiling your own exploits, right? It's not very fair if one partner drops an O-Day against another partner and, and the pool of people have to pay it out, right? Um, another thing is we acknowledge that not everyone has a lot of money to put in. So money is definitely welcome because bug bounties get payouts. But then other things that can be useful, like if you're a cloud provider and you're interested in this effort, perhaps you can um, contribute by providing cloud resources for the test environments. Um, perhaps you have kernel maintainers on staff uh, or engineers that are good at triaging and reproducing findings. Um, also, going over the, the patch sets and trying to get them upstreamed. Um, anyone who's worked with LKML knows that it can take a long time to get certain patch sets agreed upon and upstreamed. And having multiple people working together on that effort always helps. So that's it. <laughs> Come and talk to me. Um, so this is my email address at Netflix. I'll be sharing the slides. Um, we've got started a Google Doc for collaboration. Um, where we're starting to talk about things like, well, how do you structure a payout for a kernel vulnerability? Um, what would we accept as a reprodu reproduction? Um, do we put um, flags on hosts? All those kind of details of how you run a, a, a test thing like this. Um, we're starting to flesh these out, and we're looking for people who have done this before. Do you run a catch of the, capture the flag? Um, are you someone who's passionate about container security and have got some good thoughts about those security profiles? Um, so yeah, I'm happy to have some questions and come find me afterwards. So uh, one thing is that the focus here is on people coming and bringing in bugs and showing that vulnerabilities exist. Is there also any interest in looking at defensive technologies or things like this that would make it possible to perhaps block certain classes of bugs? Is that part of the so you're looking at, are there defensive technologies that block certain classes of bugs? Um, while conceptually interesting, we're trying to focus this on the kernel technology. So if you find some app armor rules that block certain things, some um, SE Linux policies, that's very interesting. Um, but like bringing in some vended solution um, or something that's not in the kernel is out of scope. Yep. There's, a lot of, there's a lot of variables in that. I mean, because with the container escapes we've seen before, some of them have been, um, the, the set of different operating systems have been vulnerable, have been 
been somewhat unexpected in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so summarize the question. Um, a lot of things depend on how the OS is configured in the runtime environment, and are, are we going to have some flexibility in how you define that? Um, so the short answer is yes. A bit more detail around that is we're thinking of running, be able to choose, like when you originally log in, is your host going to be a host with App Armor or SE Linux? Um, and then we're going to have a set of security policies. So one of those security policies will be like, for example, the Docker default that shifts with Docker, and that's, that you can have that applied. Another one might be something that you're more likely find in Kubernetes, like something without user namespaces applied. Um, so because we're trying to have a recreation of um, what we see being used by the industry, like we're not going to have it be all the defenses down. Um, <laughs> but, but at the same time, we're not going to turn everything up to 11, right? So um, we may have a pay, uh, like a, a policy that is every turn up to 11, but then we're, we're trying to have some representative ones. Um, and then we're currently thinking about for the payout structure, if, if, you, um, if you were to find an escape with everything turned up to 11, that'll give you the top payout. And we've been doing some research about payouts in kernel vulnerability space, and the top payouts in different programs range between 50 and 100K, right? So this is, we're talking about serious incentives, and so if you were to find a, a vulnerability out of the most secure policy we have, then we're talking about um, a serious payout. Conversely, if you find an escape from one of the less secure profiles, the payout will probably be cons commensurate to that. Any more questions? Okay, thanks for your time. Please come and find me afterwards, and hopefully we can help improve container security together. Yep. So what kind of time scale are you looking at for setting this thing up? Okay, so, <laughs> so at, the, at the moment we have a prototype, so um, if you ask for um, push into the Google Doc, we have links to a Git repo where we have a first iteration where we can get a shell. We're currently working on the next iteration where you could choose your profiles. Um, so we're probably looking at trying to do this in six months. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Santiago. So Santiago, from, he's a PhD, uh, PhD candidate at NYU. Um, and what you're going to be talking about I've been speaking for a really long time, sorry. <laughs> Securing the software supply chain. So let's get started. Uh, yeah, let's get started. Um, so yes, I'm Santiago. I'm a PhD student at NYU. I uh, come from Mexico. And uh, I'm going to talk about going all the way left uh, in the software supply chain. And also wonder how right we can go on the whole pipeline process. Now, the first question that I want you guys to like frame when we're talking about software supply chain is, it's a simple one. Uh, who here writes any software? I am really expecting you guys to all rise, raise your hands. <laughs> uh, and uh, well, the question is, how is software made? Uh, I'm going to just introduce a very simple, uh, like simplified software supply chain. You have a version control system in which uh, your developers check in the code. And uh, finally, some code is tagged. Uh, you may have a CI system that uh, checks out every single commit that's been pushed into master and uh, constantly compiles it. You may have a build farm that takes uh, all of that uh, signed tags and it builds a package. And finally, you may have a packaging step in which you take everything that was built by all of your developers, puts it in a Docker container, and it's ready to go. Now, the thing is, there's many things that can happen when you're, we're talking about software supply chain. I was actually glad to have the OPA talk before, because, well, you want to check these things, but you also want to make sure that nothing before uh, the actual deployment is uh, done uh, is broken. So, for example, you have uh, hackers that, well, let's, uh, let's the slides speak for themselves. You have hackers that can break into version control systems. They can introduce a backdoor in your source code. They can... Um, cleverly change the pseudo-random seed and suddenly decrypt all of the communications in your Edge uh, VPN uh, box. 
And uh, this can also happen in other places, right? This can happen in the build system. You can have a hacker that breaks into the build farm of a very high profile company and uh, start introducing backdoors. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with reproducible builds, but that's exactly what they're trying to fix. If you are able to reproduce a build, then you may be able to check exactly what happened before. And well, this is not new. This has happened to many high profile companies that are doing important software that's being used by millions of people. And well, uh, of course, this can also happen in packaging. Uh, we may have heard a story recently. I opted for like ignoring it for now. <laughs> and uh, finally, well, it, it's a little less uh, impactful. You can also think of things that can happen in terms of compliance and in terms of the effect uh, of uh, your test or your CI system telling you like, hey, something's burning, please don't release this. And uh, even though that's happening, somehow it makes it out there. So uh, I, wanna, I wanna pause here for a little minute and I want you guys to just take a look at this four steps, a very simple software supply chain. There's no CV scanning, there's no static analysis, there's, there's nothing very tricky. This is you set up your open source repository with uh, Travis CI running your tests, you have a build farm somewhere, maybe it's even your laptop, then you're packaging this in a Docker container and you're sending, you're sending this thing out. Uh, and even then, we have so many places where things can go wrong, where an attacker can basically find your weak spot, get in there, change a little sort of random number, and then your host. And uh, that's, that's the question, and that's the thing that we want to fix now. Now, how can we fix this? Uh, there's, there's many ways and very subtly wrong ways to, get, to try to fix this. It's a, it's a tricky question because, well, you have this picture here, and it's telling exactly what you want to do. This picture here tells you that uh, you want the right commits, you want the probably sign the commits, so if a hacker breaks into the version control system uh, and he's able to change the source code, he's not, you're able to tell that because the signed commit uh, is not signed, well, it's not signed by the right person as long as they haven't compromised the secret key. And then you have things like uh, DPMs and HSMs that can sign for builds, so you can check that the computer that actually runs your build is the right one. And you have things like reproducible builds that can be used to have like a constellation of different builders trying to reproduce the build and check that everyone uh, agrees and that your tool chain is not compromised. And then you have things like TUF, uh, you have things like GPG signatures and packages, you have things like TLS doing the secure delivery of your software. And uh, well, you can have all of this, but uh, the, the question remains, is this fixed? Uh, is there a way to like, still break through this, uh, through all of these point solutions. And the thing is, well, yeah, there is. You can have uh, your signed commits, but there's no way to actually make sure that the signed tag is the one that made it all the way to the build system. Maybe you can like uh, dig into the whole uh, build log and check that the hash of the tag actually matches. Or you're, you may be tricked into actually taking all of the build products and put into the, put into the container and those build products are somewhere, are backdoored somewhere. So the, the question that we want to, to like re-ask and we want to like reframe again is, we want to fix the software supply chain as a whole. We don't want to just take point solutions and call it a day. And the reason as to why is because, well, we want to make sure that these point solutions are in place. Uh, I'm framing this on the, uh, I'm part of the Intoto project and uh, so, full disclaimer. <laughs> uh, and uh, we don't, at the Intoto project, we actually don't want to change uh, any of these point solutions, but we want to make sure that you actually have all of the point solutions in place and that, it, that they can be cryptographically verified, that you can make sure that every single point solution that you put there is uh, being checked and it's being uh, used in the right way. So, it's three things that we want to make sure. We want to make sure that uh, you can verifiably verifiably define all of the steps in the supply chain. That is, if there's a commit signing, well, you want to say, hey, there should be commit signing on this VCS, and this is what you should be checking. If, uh, if people should be signing, you, should, you also want to make sure that, well, these people are the ones that are signing, right? Um, and, if, uh, and if you have other policies, you want to make sure that all of these single policies are in place, and that they are in the way that you configured them and that they are in the way that you uh, 
intended them to be, and in no other way. So, in, in a sense, we want something like tough or like notary, but for the whole supply chain. We want to make uh, compromise resilience. We want to make sure that uh, if there's a single step compromise, you still can provide some meaningful security guarantees to your users. And we want to make sure that you can uh, respect the principle of list privilege and metadata freshness. And uh, for all those familiar with tough, it's like, well, yeah. <laughs> We want to make sure that even if a certain percent of the whole infrastructure is compromised, you are able to still provide meaningful security guarantees to your users. Now, this is uh, the most simplified way that I can take the, the supply chain that we had in the beginning and uh, show you how Intoto works. You have a file that's an Intoto layout, similar to an OPA uh, policy, that says, hey, we have four steps. Uh, these four steps should produce this, should consume this, and all of these artifacts should float together up until we get to that container. And that container is the thing that you should consume. And not only that, well, we know that Bob is the one that's a release manager on the Git repository. So Bob is the one that's going to actually uh, release the software. And we know that Carl owns a build farm. And uh, we trust Carl uh, to be the one that builds things. Uh, we also know that Erin is the one that packages everything, so only Erin should be able to package a Docker container. And finally, we have Dave, that's the person that's working at the Travis CI, and that's the person that's going to be running our CI system, uh, making sure that everything is in place. Now, in the same way that the layout exists, we have a series of attestations that these uh, individuals can create to say, hey, I actually did the thing that I was told to do, Here's the digital signature that I put in there, and uh, here's what I used, and this is what I produced. When you have all of these things together, then you can actually take a paper trail, similar to like a real software supply chain, the real supply chain bill of materials. You can open your layout, you can go and say, hey, there's four things that should have happened. Where are the statements? Let's walk the paper trail all the way from the Docker container that I have here up until the very beginning, the very first uh, git commit that was produced. And that is, again, the question that I wanted to, to phrase in the beginning. We want to go all the way left to the very first line of code that was produced and all the way right up until the, the point of admission into our cluster. Now, there's a, additional features on Intoto that you can, for example, check. Well, not only were the release manager released the right thing, is were, was there a like, review policy in place? Or did the CI system have instances of the word warning in the logs? Um, now, again, this is a total supply chain. The, the name comes from in total Latin as a whole. Want to protect the whole software supply chain. In the way that the system works, you can even, if it was physically possible, to have a brainwave scanners that actually tell the intent of the developer, you could create attestations of that that say, hey, the developer was writing the right code, and he was intending to do this. Or you can go as right as possible and say, like, hey, uh, when, we were pulling the, when we were pulling the image, was the TLS certificates checked, and they were uh, compared against the transparency log, for example. Now, I'm going to wrap up, because I wanted to keep this thing uh, a little bit more um, informal, a little bit more uh, open to questions, more, with more discussion. Um, we have uh, some ongoing deployments. We have actually some work with these communities uh, that I'd like you guys to take a look at, especially you guys that are on the industry. Uh, we have a Debian reproducer as part of a reproducible builds uh, constellation in which you can essentially donate um, some resources to start rebuilding Debian packages. And then you can use an Intoto transport to say, hey, uh, I want all of the packages that I'm installing in my Docker images to be reproduced independently by three different organizations and using different tool chains. So when I install every single Debian package, I know that there wasn't a compromise in the infrastructure and there was no backdoors introduced. We have the same uh, ongoing work with Arch Linux. Um, but I also wanted to mention an, uh, other, other experiences within Toto. We've been uh, working a lot with like, cloud native communities to make a to make this as easy to deploy as possible. We actually had people from Control Plane come and say like, hey, most of the deployments that we have, all of those supply chains are automated using Jenkins. So we have an official Jenkins plugin that you can just tick a box and start producing these signed attestations. 
And we also have an admission controller that essentially does this check for you. Is this container that's coming in following the layout that I specified? And does it have all, the, all of the attestations of every single party that's supposed to be uh, interacting with us? Now, the key take takeaways that I want to have here is, well, it is very overlooked. If you think about the way that you're writing software, I like to make this uh, metaphor a lot with medicine. You generally have like a shrink wrap seal on top of the Tylenol bottle, and you have an expiration date, and you actually know if this was packed in Alabama or Chicago. And the reason, the reason as to why you want to know all of these things is because you want to be able to actually have a traceability on, a, on the sources of all of the things that you're about to consume. And in total is that. You want to take a look at exactly where the sources of everything came. And uh, I, I believe that the future is going to be like that. Every single package that we consume has this sort of traceability and protection and uh, guarantees about freshness and quality. Uh, we have a lot of production use, uh, but we want more. We want more people to take a look at this. Uh, uh, sadly, the software supply chain is a chain. <laughs> and as a chain, the weakest link is always uh, the point of attack. We want to make sure that all of the people that are involved in creating and uh, distributing all of this software are able to create this attestation so we can, everyone as a whole, develop herd immunity to supply chain compromises. And I want to invite everyone to try it in Toto. You can check in Toto.io. We have like an interactive uh, web uh, interface to create your own layouts. We have some examples of metadata. We have like Debian packages that you can check and see how we actually work those uh, examples. You can take a look at our Jenkins uh, plugin and our Kubernetes admission controller and uh, see how it could better fit. We're also hoping that all of you people trying out in Toto will come back to us and say like, hey, does this fit our use cases? Is there a way to actually make it work for my very special, very different way of approaching things? Um, and with this, I also wanted to give credit to, I'm not the only person doing this, and uh, I'm, opening, I'm opening the floor to questions. Also, please meet with me if you want to discuss ways forward. Okay. Yes, the, the question was, uh, what kind of primitives do exist to do integrations within Toto? Uh, if, for example, you want to use GitLab CI instead of Jenkins, how can I make this happen? So we have, a, we have different implementations that have a library that's like interoperable. Uh, we have a Java implementation, we have a Go implementation, and we have a Python implementation. Uh, we also have a CLI tool that you can use. If, uh, let me just flash back here. Oh, no, I actually took it out. Took it out. Okay, sorry. We have a CLI tool um, that you can use to wrap. You can say, like, in total run, do this, and it will produce an attestation. But if not, for example, for the Jenkins plugin, I basically took the Java library, wrapped it up in the Jenkins plugin, and I just tweaked things here and there to work with the credential plugin and all of, the, all of those things. Um, we're also like very open to try new ways to do things. Uh, but I think uh, as the ecosystem is right now, you can basically just take the library in, import it, put it in the right places in your specific scenario, and it will produce metadata. Yes, we should. Uh, it rings a bell, but um, I don't think I know exactly. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, I actually took a, like, a, a lot of like, uh, DOD uh, work in there too, because, well, if you think about government, then <laughs> that's the kind of things that you want to get right. Yeah, I think that it's going to be more implementation. It seems to be more policy-based, for instance. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I'll consider it. I actually, I don't know if you want to add something. Uh, because we, we work with GobReady, and I... Talk about that and talk about SPDX and some of the other efforts, and that'll clear it up. Right. 
So um, we were approached by a, by a team called GovReady, uh, by a project called GovReady, and they basically wanted to automate this enforcement of, uh, on bill of materials for software and also for like deployment compliance. Uh, as far as I understand, they were very, working closely with uh, government agencies and they wanted to do exactly this. They wanted to encode the best practices that the government agencies wanted to do. Uh, for all of their deployments and uh, be able to verify them within Toto. Um, we're also working closely with another project that's part of the Linux Foundation umbrella, that's uh, SPDX. And they're trying to set up a language, or they don't want to call it a language, but uh, more of a, like a taxonomy of how software is made and how it can be described in like many different ways. And uh, the cool thing is that in Toto works with all of that because uh, it's very, it's very thin and it can essentially wrap any of these things. We're actually introducing native support for OCI v2 manifests and for, uh, and for SPDX package identifiers. So in your metadata for Intoto, you can say, hey, this is an SPDX identifier, go look it up. Or this is an OCI v2 image, just pull out the manifest. Do you want to come up? <laughs> so, so they are the way to say the thing, and we actually make sure that what was supposed to be said wasn't here. Right. Um, so Justin here um, uh, wanted to point out, and I think it's, a, it's an important point to make, is that uh, we're not trying to tell you how you should uh, do things. We want to make sure that you are able to say that and check it in a sensible way. So we're not the one that tells you how to do things, we're the ones that let you check it in a cryptographically verifiable way. So we have briefly looked at the possibility of using a blockchain as a transport to storing metadata and um, I know there's a similar project called Sparks that's trying to do this. Um, we, don't, we want to be transport agnostic. As a matter of fact, we, work, uh, we can work on sneaker net if needed. Um, I do think that there's properties that the blockchain can provide you that can give you better assurance about uh, freshness and about uh, the timeliness of all things, uh, like of all the versions of your... But we have also have... Uh, big cloud native companies with a big logo in their <laughs> in the sponsors list that are using uh, Tough and in Toto to actually give this sort of like um, lineage of how the packages were built following the specification but what came before them and you can use this to do all sorts of like cool cross referencing and auditing of the package quality Uh, I think that's it. Oh, are you? Uh, I'm sorry, I think I can hear you all the way back. Do we have a microphone? <laughs> Uh, let me rephrase this uh, to see if uh, I understood it correctly. So how do we go with uh, dependencies and third-party libraries and so on and so forth to actually make it verifiable? We have a primitive that I didn't speak about here. That's a very good question, by the way. That's, uh, that's I think, uh, something that made uh, me and Justin iterate over many different designs throughout five years of work. Um, we basically have this concept of a sub-layout that can give you two properties. One of them is specify third-party libraries in which you can say this step is actually a, another supply chain. I'm just uh, plugging this in into my... Uh, this way you can say, hey, all of this software, uh, pull out all of the metadata for, I don't know, Liftif, and uh, this will be part of my, of my supply chain, but I, I am able to verify that they did all of the right things that they wanted to do. And uh, this also gives you the property, and I've seen this used in like bigger organizations, that you can essentially say, like, I know that my general idea is we have, we have some software, uh, some source code made, 
this is built somewhere and this is packaged somewhere. But I know that the A, B, and C are the ones that are going to do that. So they will define in a, like a more granular way how is this going to happen. So you have some sort of like a fractal that goes all the way down up until very, like very, very granular, very, very specific information about the software supply chain and the, the process that was made. I'm very bad at like finding hands, so I don't know if <laughs> I think that's it. Any more questions? All right, I think that's it. I'm sorry? <laughs> I think that's it. Okay. All right.